As with many of the weapons in the darkness of the far future, they're often as destructive and horrifying as they are creative. We've already seen how some in the ranks of the Imperium have access to grenades that will actually collapse real space and form a vortex that either shreds or rips real matter from the Materium into the void. So it should be no surprise to us that those who have chosen to exist in that same dark space would have their own nightmare versions of classic hand-delivered projectiles. One of the most disturbing of these are what are known as Blight Grenades. These are used exclusively by the followers of Nurgle, and while on the face of it they may seem fairly straightforward, as is often the case, there is more to bear in mind here than just an obscenely foul, hand-delivered disease bomb of horror. Blight grenades may not be as severe as something like the life-eater virus used in exterminatus processes, but they are, I think, about as close as you may come to a localised version of this. Firstly, let us consider those most common users of blight grenades, the Plague Marines of Nurgle. These are marines who have fully committed and or allowed themselves to be consumed by the chaos god of pestilence, plagues and despair, Nurgle. What were once the loyalist marines of the Death Guard are now generally known as Plague Marines. They are followers especially loved by the grandfather of disease, and this is likely due to their resilience, being former Astartes, enabling them to endure and carry the weight of most, if not all the blessings that Nurgle may choose to bestow upon them, and still stay functional. And this is something that few if any mortal humans would be able to come even close to enduring, for the horror of the rotting plagues and diseases Nurgle is capable of inflicting are powerful and innumerable. Plague Marines have become immune to physical feeling due to their condition of becoming essentially rotting, maggot-infested creatures whose swollen bodies leak both fluid and their organs hanging out from their distended torsos. Any ordinary mortal could not carry the full burden of Nurgle's blessings, but for the Plague Marines they are able to do this. And this will be in part due to their Death Guard heritage of actively embracing powerful poisons and building their resilience. What was once seen as an advantageous trait has now ultimately sealed their fate. But as the blessings of Nurgle consumed them with near totality, they now wield near complete immunity to pain. This combined with their fattened, swollen bodies means that they're considerably tougher than ordinary marines and will take much more firepower to bring them down. Their ability to not only endure but bear witness to suffering is, as a point of reference, demonstrated by them observing the nightmares suffered by ordinary human mortals who are unfortunate enough to come into contact with even a peripheral infliction of what Nurgle is truly capable of. Human victims of Nurgle could be contaminated with any number of unbearable conditions. Some, for example, may force mortal humans to weep continuously until their eye sockets are bleeding sores, no longer weeping with fluid, but a sticky glue-like pus that will eventually seal their eyelids shut before finally rotting through their eyeballs and slowly devouring their skull cavity. Others who are more specifically targeted may endure a hell few could comprehend as their bodies are focused on by the god of plague and they will consciously endure the entire process of their body's own decomposition while they are still technically living. Organs and fluids blackened, swelling and spilling out all over them before the power of the warp is channeled to enable them to reverse and re-enjoy the experience over and over again until their suffering undoubtedly causes their mind to become nothing but jelly. Horrors such as these are not foul or disgusting to the servants of Nurgle, in fact the opposite. Followers of Nurgle delight in not only spreading and transmitting their plagues, but observing the beauty and variety of how their victims suffer the process. And I'll bring in a small aside that I always think is important to understand when it comes to chaos. And this is that whether the followers of a god seek to figuratively bathe in the blood of their victims, draw power as they delight in the creatively nightmarish experiences of both pleasure and pain, undoubtedly devised for some poor wretches to be subjected to, and even those who live to inflict suffering and diseased horror on mortals. In all of this, we must consider and remember that for those who have given their souls fully to a specific god of chaos, especially for chaos marines beyond the physical, this has the process of entirely altering their perception of reality as humanity may perceive it. While undoubtedly abhorrent to us, they will not see their actions as disgusting, demonic, depraved, 
torturous or obscene. In fact, they will far more likely see their actions in quite the opposite light. They, through their actions, will inflict such unbearable suffering upon mortal entities, they often feel this to be a positive, constructive, even joyous act that should please not only their victims, but of course also benefit themselves and the gods they serve. And this altered perception can often leave followers of Chaos appearing confused when their unwilling mortal victims do not seem to share the same enthusiasm for their suffering. Why should anyone not be pleased to be flayed alive or rotted into liquid from the inside out? Such strange beings these mortals are. And this really is a whole other topic, and I think this idea of moral perception is always relevant in any discussion of chaos-related matters. It raises questions around the nature and intentions of chaos from our own limited perception, as well as, of course, the primordial truth. The position that I've seen often held that chaos is defined by its actions and as such is automatically a negative entity, to me is entirely open to debate. Especially once you understand that chaos imbues traits that are not only negative, it also imbues things like honour, ambition, freedom from suffering, which depending on the context are not necessarily always seen as negatives. Plus, of course, when we start to consider that chaos, at least to some degree, requires a symbiotic relationship with mortal creatures, but this all opens up so many cans of worms, we're really heading way off topic. So reading this back in, the core point is that it is by design, as are many of the conceptions of the chaos gods or their servants, that blight grenades seek to inflict appalling suffering via every mortal sense. The actual blight grenades themselves are often made from the shrunken heads of those mortals killed by Nurgle's favourite plagues. However, they can sometimes also be fashioned with heavily rusted metal. These heads are filled with virus and disease-saturated pus, accompanied by either live biting flies or fat larvae who want to burrow into any flesh they find contact with. The rotten head itself will be stoppered with wax. When thrown, blight grenades will not create a major concussive effect, but they are fitted with small explosive charges that will release a shockwave of pressure enough to burst and throw out shrapnel. Most often though, they will simply splatter across the ground near to or bursting upon its target. Puddles of foul putrid slime will pour forth or drown the victim as any gaps and orifices of the unlucky recipient are filled, as well as releasing black clouds of poisonous angry flies. The unfortunate targets of these grenades will find that any exposed chink in armour or their orifices will be filled with putrid body fluids, powerful toxins and insects that want to crawl inside of you to quite literally get under your skin and consume you so as you become quickly a stinking fly-blown nightmare, ready to burst forth from you as your accelerated rotting corpse becomes a gas-filled bubble of death. If the grenades do burst with enough force, they may unleash metal shrapnel or bone fragments which will shred exposed flesh, but they cause more damage than mere flesh wounds, as they'll be laced with plague and toxins that will rapidly infect their victims before the very eyes of their comrades, their bodies becoming corrupted and infested, their veins turning black and their body painfully swelling with fluid, and if they're not already begging for the end, they'll soon wish that they had, as their skin begins to split and they collapse and writhe in twisted agony, no longer able to speak as the god of decay visits their flesh with his foul corruption, his creative virus and plagues keeping the victim alive throughout so they can be sure to miss nothing. For it is by the very will of Nurgle that their victims are fully conscious so as to appreciate the bountiful gifts the god of decay has blessed them with, until finally they are either liquefied or left dragging themselves along the ground to a final agonising end. For any onlookers with even a shred of decency, putting any infected associates out of their misery as quickly as possible should be the only merciful option, and that is providing the viruses have not already spread so quickly as to prevent any kind of mercy killing. It is said that the origins of blight grenades are far more closely tied to the nature of Nurgle than them being a mere stylized grenade. For the Plague Marines seek not only the corruption of humanity, they bear an ever-consuming task to spread the gifts of their lord and master, Nurgle. There are also those individuals like the biologist putrefies of the Death Guard who see their battles not only as conflicts to emerge victorious from, they see battles against the weak humans of mankind as their personal laboratories, throwing braces of blight grenades to see how effective and creative their latest concoctions of diseases have become. They will then observe the speed of the spread of corruption and study the writhing wretches who exhibit the most harrowingly explicit or unusual consequences on display. 
any of those unaffected will have the Plague Marine's injector pistols turned upon them to manually inject victims with similarly appalling pathogens that turn them into a liquid sludge from the inside out, causing them to burst into boils like a tree bearing instantaneous bleeding fruits or projectile vomit clouds of flies and acidic bile burning and dissolving their soft tissue in the process, leaving them as ruined still living carcasses. Victims of either the blight grenade or injectors will have their fluids harvested for study in yet further refinement later, to produce even more aggressive or creative effects for future deployment. This process of testing is a large element of what the entity, the god of Nurgle, is focused upon. The grandfather of plagues, much like the putrefiers of the death god, desires to know which of his ever more virulent strains is most effective and all corrupting. His demonic progeny, the Plague Bearers, are tasked with keeping track of these diseases and how they assault the mortal world. The Plague Bearers will monitor each individual and creature afflicted by the plagues and diseases of Nurgle, and this unimaginably complex task is somehow still managed by the demons of Nurgle, likely due to the nature of the warp itself, but in order to keep even a reasonably accurate count, they use vast abacus of rusted metal, and not wooden beads, but shrunken, diseased heads of the victims of Nurgle. As I previously noted, the perception of those entities who belong to any specific spectrum of chaos will not see their actions or aesthetics as would mortal humans. What we see as foul, stinking corruption, the entities and followers of Nurgle will see as beautiful, joyous displays of fecundity. But this causes problems for those plague bearers keeping the count, as greater demons known as the Great and Clean Ones view them as wasted gifts that are squandered on the lower demons. The greater demons want to see the virus filled heads used to further the cause of Nurgle, and so they'll deploy their Nurglings, the smaller demonic kin, to steal the abacus heads from the plague bearers, which the counters of plague continually expect and will gladly crush, impale, or otherwise dispatch those minions of the greater demons. However, the Nurglings will often succeed and escape with a bounty of horror to drag back to their masters. Their gracious reward scraps of rotting flesh. Studying the heads, a greater demon of Nurgle will carefully choose those which best inspire its curiosity for ever more depraved virulence, or that which best appeases its general curiosity into the ever myriad diseases of the Plague Father. Yet these vast hulking demons are nothing, if not fickle, and they will readily discard most of the heads brought before them, only taking an interest in the most unusual or promising of plagues. These will then be later distributed among their many trinkets, gifts, and symbolic gestures of approval gifted by the greater demon to its mortal followers. Few, though, would truly appreciate the power and nightmare of what is known as the Death Heads. Few, that is, until the Death Guard. A greater demon known as Kugath would see fit to gift the Death Guard with three entire abacus of Death Heads an unprecedented bounty to bestow upon mortal followers of Nurgle, for Kugath saw great promise and great capacity for the corruption of mortal worlds in the Death Guard. Each death head contained foul pestilence and plague, powerful enough to render not just one Imperial world, but indeed an entire system, into a foul weeping sore for the Imperium of Man, choked and quarantined by the inexplicable nature of the contagion. The Death Guard, the Plague Marines, were of course joyous at such an acknowledgement of their abilities and the demon's faith for them to deliver its plans of pandemic inception. And this is the horrifying aspect of a true death head, a true blight grenade of Nurgle, for even the most powerful of the Imperium's grenades can only cause localised damage, catastrophic though it may be. But a pure blight grenade from the realm of the demons holds potentially the power, if delivered correctly to the enemy, to consume an entire system into a choking cesspit of abhorrent disease that it may never again escape from. Blight grenades are not mere frags to be tossed toward an enemy with intentions of just maiming a few enemy soldiers. Such a pitifully unimaginative weapon, so small-minded. A single blight grenade delivered with the due diligence, prestige and knowledge it deserves as a gift from the god of decay himself has the power to render entire worlds not only a lost cause for humanity, but also to bolster and increase the scope and territorial presence of Nurgle in the Materium. What comparable mortal weapon of size and simplicity can deliver such a huge return for its owners? And so the Death Guard would use the heads bestowed upon them by Kugath to obliterate and ruin scores of lush agricultural worlds in the Demeter sector, 
leaving them all but lost. But as they used them to good effect, they also burned quickly through the bounty of Kugath, and no amount of worship or ritualistic offering appeased their masters to deliver further death heads to the plague marines. Because after all, the demons and especially the gods of the Immaterium pay only peripheral attention to the cause of their followers in the Materium, and it requires a truly extreme offering to focus the attention of greater demons in the war. With no more pure blight grenades of Nurgle, instead, the Death Guards sought alternative measures. They would craft their own death heads, and they descended to the worlds they had blighted and extracted hundreds, if not thousands, of heads and skulls of the rotting inhabitants. These skulls were rendered in massive vats boiling over with blackened blood. The vessels then filled with infected matter and stoppered with wax as they had learned from the true death heads of the plague bearer Abacus. Except that the death guard, the plague marines, were no masters of pestilence and plague. They are comparatively nothing compared to the plague father and his greater demons. And so it is that their own blight grenades, their versions of these, were weak offerings by comparison. Those used today are nothing compared to the true death heads of Nurgle. And the Plague Marines now seek, much like Nurgle itself, to ever refine and increase the power of their toxic concoctions to bring them to the level they saw from the true warp death heads. However, it is said the Mortarian himself, the Primarch of the Death Guard, Demon Prince of Nurgle, has mastered the true formula for the death head but that he is saving his personal blight grenades for battles against the most powerful of the Imperium's forces, the Grey Knights, and perhaps even his brother Primarchs. For now, humanity is able to endure the localised plagues when encountering the Death Guard, but should the Plague Marines ever receive the attentions again of Kugath or other great demons of Nurgle, and that they may see fit to bestow upon them further true Death Head blight grenades, the consequences could be beyond estimation.